You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore data. Well, I'm a couple days ahead, but I think for those of you listening right now, assuming you're listening to the day this is released, are we five days away? Is that right? Because I think I am seven, and I have one already for tomorrow, and then yeah, it's five, yeah, something like that. Like five days, man. I crushed it this weekend, dude. I, family was gone. I just recorded podcasts. It's also the nice thing about this off season period is um, I was doing that for a while. I think last year, so I could I could release podcasts a day early. It got confusing as all heck, but I could release a podcast a day early on Patreon. But then once the season starts, it's like I can't do that because it needs to be up to date. So, anyways, can still do packing it after dark that way, I guess. That'll that'll ease some of the stress and tension. But um, I, I, I really, really do have to talk about the running back thing just a little bit more. Because as I said, it was, it was brand, brand new in my brains. And um, now I'm starting to see a little bit more. And it's, 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 there's just a couple funny little points that, that I found that I wanted to bring up. The first one is sort of a, uh, there's only two kinds of people in the world sort of thing. And uh, obviously, I do that pretty much daily. So there's there's lots of different kinds of people. There's a lot of categories in which there's two kinds of people. And I just want to play for you quickly the two kinds of people. And you can figure out which one I'm going to say is probably the right kind of person you should be listening to. And the other person who has a massive platform that basically nobody should listen to, but does because he has major people on his platform, because he works for a, a giant organization, but really provides nothing by way of um, actual information. Not going to tell you who's who. You're going to have to guess for yourself which one is super great and which one is not. They come up, come, come down on different sides of the running back argument. Here's number one. Jack. It's as simple as this. It's as simple as this. The running back position in the National Football League is as crucial a position as there is. All we talk about in this sport is girding your loins and going to hit somebody in the mouth. That's what you do. And you take the hits and you absorb the hits and you deliver the hits and you make sure your opponent's will gets winnowed with each snap until you win a football game. Yes, there are many X's and O's to this game and many important positions on the field. It's a team sport. And yes, there is a brain aspect to it. There's a, that's the thing I love about the football, uh, that the, the football mindset is that it does involve intelligence as well. You got to be smart to play this game. And so, no position in terms of understanding what happens pre snap, what happens post snap, if you get the football. What's more, what's, what's more important, who's more important than the running back? Who could get that one yard? Who c- All right. That is number one. That's a different YouTube video. I have 
quite a few YouTube videos open right now, some of which are for this podcast, some of which are for my own personal consumption, like poorest regions of America, what it really looks like to us. I haven't started it yet, it just sounds interesting. It's all about the uh, Appalachia. Anyways, here is argument number two. Well, the running backs uh, are not happy. So let's talk about running backs in the NFL. If you know one thing about me, you know that I don't like BS arguments. I'd swear, but it's very early into the podcast. I just don't like arguments where I look at it and go, you know what? A lot of the stuff you're saying just isn't applicable to your current position as a running back in the NFL. There's two things working against running backs, reality and evolution. Uh, the pass is more valuable. It took the NFL way too long to figure this out. I remember the two things quote. You remember that one? I don't know if that was a Parcells one or not, but it got repeated all the time. It was like only three things can happen on a pass and two of them are bad, incompletion and interception. I never understood it because it was like, well, what would like, so it's a 50% success ratio on runs. You could argue three things can happen on a run and two of them are bad. If you throw a fumble in there, right? Um, I never understood. I you know, look identity, punch him in the mouth, let him feel you, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. But like the first play in an NFL game where the defense, it's their first snap. They're never going to have more energy and they're never going to be more excited. And then you decide to run it right up the middle. It's like, cool. Now it's second and nine. So the league always should have been passing more. You should have been putting athletes out in space and the reward of what a pass attempt could be far out outweighs what a rushing attempt could be, despite the understanding of knowing that there should be balance. Uh, but that was a quote that a lot of people hung on to for a long time. I don't remember if it was necessarily a Parcells one. Parcells used to have, you know, the record is you are, um, you are what your record says you are. I don't know. What if my first eight games are against way tougher opponents than yours and we're both four and four? I don't buy that one either. I remember there was another rushing stat that never made any sense to me. And they used to actually put this into like research packets and they put graphics up on television, whether it was ESPN, CBS, Fox. And it was like, oh, when this team runs it 22 or more times, they win 78% of their games. And you start thinking to be like, wait, is it because they're running or are they running because they're already winning the game? And then we realized, yeah, that's kind of a dumb stat. So let's get rid of that one. We have grown up for decades thinking that you had to run the football late in the season to win a Super Bowl. It's just not true anymore. It's nice. Balance is nice. Keeping the defense honest, but it's not a priority. And the running backs are feeling that pain. Um, when I look at the passing evolution of it working its way up from high school, college, and then to the NFL, which is more fun, and I think just better off your better overall reward math that we've talked about here uh, in a football game, it's a lot like the NBA. I mean, the, the the correlation is very similar to the NBA. They should have been shooting more threes. And I'll admit, there's league pass nights where I'm like, this sucks. I don't want to watch. All right. Let's, uh, it, it just naturally kind of decided to glitch on me. So let's just go back for a second. Let's let Rich Eisen continue his argument. We'll just kind of go back and forth and see which one seems more, um, I don't want to say compelling, because that's not necessarily what we're shooting for. Correct. Could actually be the matchup nightmare and grab the ball out of the air because he's getting it thrown to him. Have to un oh, come on. understand passing routes and concepts as well as blocking schemes. And who's the mic? Hmm. Because you might have to protect <laughs> your quarterback. You're I'm trying so hard to just. I got to mute my mic. Going to the line of scrimmage, and you're thinking, I'm getting this football in my belly, and I'm going to run somebody over. Oh, wait a minute. No, the defense is this. Oh, wait a minute. My quarterback just changed my responsibility to protect him. Okay, let's go back. Watch this tonight. It's just a three-point shooting contest. But it's the best way, if there's a talent gap, to try to hang in a game, uh, even if I missed some of the stuff that I grew up with. You know, do I really miss post-play? <laughs> maybe a little. Uh, and I realize that Jokic and Embiid are two of the best players in the league, but Jokic is in his own category of like what he's capable of doing. And Embiid, I still think if your playoff success is based on dumping into a big who's going to have double and triple teams swarming all over himself, and then the ball is going to have to get kicked out to somebody else. Like, I don't know that you really want to run your team or your offense through the post. Although I've been willing to maybe zag on post positioning but I have not come to any kind of conclusion okay, stop talking about on basketball. any of this. This is the evolution of sports. 
I mean, you know, do you remember like we used to have power forwards where he was the other guy on a block? NBA offense has had a center on one. All right, he's pissing me off now. Um, look, it, it, we've, we've got two arguments here, right? One is running backs have been overvalued for a long time because the NFL has been too stupid and too focused. Stupid is a little unfair, but, but in a sense, kind of. Too focused on tradition to recognize or, or to take the time to actually use your brain or allow other people to come into your industry who have brains to analyze efficiency, right? That's all we're doing. What is the best... Po- I mean, we, we have limited resources across the board. Limited numbers of players, limited numbers of opportunities, num- limited numbers of plays. Salary cap is a limit. We need to maximize everything. How do we maximize it? And the NFL has had... W- the the NFL community has had one resounding answer to that question. Stop frickin' running the ball so much and throw it. And Rich Eisen says, yeah, but all we talk about is smashing people in the mouth. No, no, we don't. I mean, I do that sometimes because it's kind of fun to talk about. It's cool. If you got a running back, I'd like him to smash somebody in the mouth. But that's not all we talk about. That's false. In fact, I would be willing to bet if you listen to Rich Eisen, he talks significantly more about quarterbacks and wide receivers than he does running backs because it's what people want to hear because it's what people care about because it's what matters. But suddenly, we're having a save the Dolphins moment where we have to rush to the aid of running backs. And so, of course, Rich Eisen wants to jump in on that and be one of the heroes and have all the people on social media praise him and cheer him. The other thing that annoys me about all of this is that we don't recognize that because there is a salary cap, because there is a limit, there's only... There's not an underpayment somewhere there is a lack of allocation and if you increase the allocation to running backs you have to decrease it somewhere else guess who's not willing to have that conversation about who should be paid less rich eisen because he wants to be everybody's buddy he just wants to pretend we can just pay running backs more and there's no there's no repercussions anywhere else like number one somebody's getting paid less number two the teams in the nfl are going to start to suck but if it makes him get all warm and fuzzy about equality then i guess it's just what has to happen Right? The Chiefs will just win every Super Bowl from now on, and everybody else just needs to go out and pay a billion dollars to running backs. We should just be paying them 20 million bucks or more. I mean, wide receivers are pushing 30 now, so I guess it should be 25, 30 ish, and everyone should just suck. Except, again, the Chiefs, who, you know, won't, or any other team that chooses not to play along with Rich Eisen's stupid um, save the Dolphins uh, routine here. You know what this reminds me of? Rich Eisen, along with. Everybody else that that seems to be on this train here. I've got two more points that I want to bring up, but it reminds me, you remember when um, there is that episode of The Office where The Office is split on whether, what is her name, the actress is um, hot or not? Oh, Hillary Swank, right? Trying to decide if Hillary Swank is hot. It's this scene right here. You know, we don't really see them as real, so therefore we don't judge them as real people. Are you serious? Jim, just show us a picture. Kevin, come on. Yeah, shut up, Kevin. No, but he's making all these fancy... It's j- it's a gut thing. That's all I'm hearing. That's all... He's. They're making all these fancy... It, it, it's a gut thing. And that's literally all we heard from Rich Eisen. It's all we heard. It's a gut thing. We, we know it in our bones, in our gut. Like, we talk like, smash him in the mouth and... Rah. It's a gut thing. You know in your gut they're worth more. How do you know they're worth more? I just, you just know. By the way, the most hilarious part of that Rich Eisen thing, he may, I mean, I, I think, I, I mentioned I, I didn't want persuasion because I thought Rich Eisen could do, do a good job with that. That was the least persuasive argument I've ever heard in my life. Even just from an emotional standpoint, that sucked. He used the phrase, get that yard, first of all. Which, by the way, I don't even know that running backs are the most efficient way to get that yard anymore. But even still, if, you're, if your um, selling point is they can get a yard, that sucks. But even worse than that, he started going into how, how intelligent they need to be. They need to be brilliant, which I think is wildly untrue, based largely on the fact that there is no more plug-and-play position than running back. But beyond that, he starts talking about, oh, 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 I gotta know who the mic is, and then, oh, the quarterback changed my play. Dude, that is literally every single human being on the offense. The offensive line, 
There are checks to the offensive line in which the offensive line has to change. And not only that, not only do they need to know their assignment, they need to know everybody else's, and they need to be able to communicate to their offensive line so everybody understands their specific assignment. Tight ends, same thing. Wide receivers, same thing. This is not, first of all, it's not even, it doesn't even come close to being persuasive in terms of, yes, they deserve tens of millions more dollars than they're getting because they're because sometimes plays change. That's everybody on the defense, by the way. It's just not even a good argument, period. That was the worst thing I've ever heard. But again, you get people that actually know what they're talking about. This, by the way, is Ryan Rossillo over at The Ringer. And again, he just, he knows what the data says. Everybody knows what the data says. And and here's, here's the kicker. It's not just that um, he knows what the data says. The reason the NFL is moving away from their longstanding traditions, which make, make, make no mistake, mistake, they do not want to do that. The reason they're doing it is because the analytics community came in and said, start doing these things. And they, they move so slowly because they don't want to listen to the analytics community. They hate the analytics community. They do. I mean, we, we heard that all the way back to Mike McCarthy. Like He'd roll his eyes at the, the, the analytics and the numbers and all that. Even today, they roll their eyes at it. But you know what? We keep moving that way. Going forward on fourth down. That was an analytics thing. Nobody wanted to listen. There, there was a time in the NFL, not oh so long ago, when literally never, ever, 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 unless you have to, as in game on the line, go for it on fourth down. That was the only time you did it. Once in an unbelievable... I mean, it was, it was like a, an onside... It was basically an onside kick. So you would see it, but it was, it was like almost never, ever, 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 ever. Now it's extremely common. That is an analytics thing. And it, it, the, the point is, though, some teams start to do it, and they start to have more success, and you have no choice but to copy the other teams who are doing it and having more success. This isn't just arbitrary analytics, some random people with charts and graphs saying stuff, and people being like, oh, I'm an idiot, I guess I'll listen. No, it's a concept that is proving itself out. It's not the teams that focus on running the ball that are winning. It's not the Chicago Bears, who are actually one of the better running teams we've seen in a long time, who win 0-10 to finish the season, that are, that are really going to be very persuasive in their uh, effort. And by the way, <laughs> one of the, some of the best rushing teams in football, you know who they are? They're teams with mobile quarterbacks. It's not even the running backs. Mobile quarterbacks make up a big part of, of their identity as a rushing team. You get rid of Justin Fields and Lamar Jackson in Baltimore and in Chicago, I'm not saying they're not going to be um, any good at running, but they're not going to be anywhere near the caliber of rushing attack that they were. The threat of the quarterback is a big part of that, which again detracts from the value of the running back. You want to run the ball? Well, good. Go get a mobile quarterback. That'll help. But even that, it's not going to win you football games. If running the ball won you football games, the Bears would have been 10-0 and down the stretch, not 0-10. They were the number one rushing team in football. Number two in attempts, number one in yards, number seven in touchdowns, number one in yards per attempt. 5.4 yards per attempt. They were the worst team in football. The best rushing team was the worst team in football. And you're going to sit here and tell me that running is, is uber important. I mean, th th there is no better example because they were the number one rushing team and the number 32 passing team. Number one rushing team, number 32 passing team, worst team in football. Figure that one out, running backs. And again, the only reason they were the number one rushing team is because of a quarterback. It wasn't even the running backs that did it. So even if you wanted to be the number one rushing team, which I don't know why you would because it proved nothing in Chicago, um, go get Anthony Richardson. The Colts could be the number one rushing team in football this year if, if they really wanted to, if they're going to commit to that guy. They, they, could, they could do exactly what the Bears did, be a terrible passing team, an elite rushing team, and get the number one overall pick next year if that's what they really, really want to do. You know what I mean? That would, be, that would just be fan-freaking-tastic. Is that what you want to do? Again, I'm not talking about the analytics community coming up with fake little charts. I'm talking about real life. I'm talking about the number one rushing team, worst team in football. That's what I'm talking about. And pretty much every playoff team was top half in passing. I think the only exception was like Tampa Bay, who was 19th. I mean, and if you want to succeed, that's where you got to go. Top 10 teams, or the top 10 passing teams are the teams that are going to be the top teams in the NFL. Buffalo Bills were 6th. The uh, Philadelphia Eagles were 4th. The, let's see, Tampa is garbage. The, um, the heck of the Chiefs. Chiefs who won the Super Bowl were number 1. 
Cincinnati Bengals were 8th. Even the Vikings and the Jaguars were, were close. The Jaguars were 11th. The Vikings, who, you know, as, as fraudulent as they were, were, um, the heck are they, 13th, I think? Yeah, 13th. Oh, and the 49ers were 3rd. It's passing. And if, if you want to play these games where you want to focus on your virtue signaling rather than actually winning football games, that's fine, but your team is going to suck. And I'm sorry, as much as you may want to piss and moan and score some points on social media about it, you better pray to the God above that the Green Bay Packers don't start listening to you. Because this team will collapse immediately. In 2017, Green Bay Packers were 7-9. and nine. We ranked 31st in passing. In 2018, we were 6-9, and nine, ranked 21st in passing. Second in rushing, by the way. In 2019, start to turn things around. 16th in passing. We go to the playoffs. 2020, best possible year, number two in passing. 2021, sixth in passing. Playoffs again. Then in 2022, we drop off to 15th in passing. We go eight and nine. We're about a 500 team. So right in the middle of passing, right in the middle of, with our record. There is a direct correlation between how good of a passing team you are and how good of a team you are. I shouldn't say direct correlation, but there is certainly a correlation there. There is no correlation with running. And Rich Eisen going on his whole gut thing argument is just stupid. Anyways, I want to play this too. This is from uh, Mike Florio. He's got uh, his little twist on things, which uh, there's another thing on Twitter that's... So So there's there, all these different people have like slightly different arguments. That's why I wanted to talk about it again, because you start to see these different angles people are coming from, and it's like, oh, that's okay. And then you got to rethink and formulate what you think about that. But here's sort of uh, another kind of a slightly different, but kind of what we've been talking about um, attack on this. I went to something that happened yesterday, and I'm still trying to get some details on it. It relates to the running backs. It looks like the running backs are getting serious about doing something, taking some sort of collective action. Austin Eckler, the Chargers running back, was on with Zach Gelb last night, CBS Sports Radio, saying you poke the bear and we have to do something now. Wants answers from ownership about the running back position. Well, I don't think ownership is who you have to go to. I don't think ownership cares. So a couple things. First of all, he's absolutely correct. Of course, they want answers from ownership because the assumption is whenever there's inequity, as, as which is a very popular buzzword we have to assume it's the rich billionaires who are causing the inequity that's obviously stupid these are gms who are making these decisions it's not the owners coming down saying don't you dare pay them their garbage no gms are looking at data and trying to build the best possible team and they realize that running backs are not necessarily the best way to go about doing that and that's why you're not getting 25 million dollar um a year running backs it's not a thing right like oh yeah we invested really heavily in running backs so we're stupid the guy's getting what 13 million aaron jones I mean, the fact that that is the ceiling yes we're, we're paying top dollar but the the problem is what is top dollar that's what people are arguing about um it's not the rich billionaire owners it's the gms trying their best to make football teams win and recognizing that running backs are not how that happens they're will they want good running backs but th th the other point that i wanted to make is the Austin Eckler trying to push back and, and doing some kind of action like a holdout or whatever, that's only going to work if you believe that this is genuinely discrimination, which is clearly stupid. There is no reason to believe that this is any form of discrimination, which means it's based on actual data. And the problem for you is if it is based on actual data, your holdout isn't going to work. You're just going to be replaced. You're going to be replaced because some guy making $1.2 million is going to get your job making $9 million and they're going to smile from ear to ear doing it. There are a lot of people who would love to be making what you're making who are never going to make it unless you take action and leave. And you know what? The drop off in production, there will be some, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be very much. You're never going to be paid more than, than what you're worth, period. It's, it's never going to be a thing. This is it's no different than out in the economy. Like, well, this is unfair. We should pay McDonald's workers $30 an hour. They're never going to make $30 an hour. You know why? Because they don't generate enough to make $30 an hour. And that's why they will be replaced by robots, because it's just cheaper that way. But I'm not going to pay more than what you generate for me. It's the same with running backs. You can piss and moan and cry about it all you want. It doesn't make any difference. 
It's never going to happen. They're never going to pay you $25 million when you generate $10 million worth of value. If you're going to get overpaid, and I know some guys get overpaid, fine. You're going to get overpaid to the tune of $12, $13 million. And, of course, we're going to jack with the contract a little bit so that on the back end we're, we're hopefully going to come out ahead anyways. But, but to think that you're actually going to... Because, again, it, it will work if you're right. It's going to work if you're actually worth $25 million and they're just paying you 15 right? And, and, and be just out of pure bias and, and collusion and everything else, then you're right because they need you. You're generating $25 million worth of value and you're leaving. I have to pay you. The problem is you're wrong. And so you're not going to get paid that. Now, it depends what you're asking for. If you're, if you're a, you know, again, part of the issue is some of the older running backs are upset that they're not getting big contracts when everybody understands that you basically peak at 26 years old and start to decline. So you got 29, 30 year old running backs going, hey, I want a $15 million bag. And it's like, bro, no, like I'll, I'll give you seven for a year with a bunch of contingencies in it. Like if you bust your knee, you're screwed. And they don't like that. But again, tough. They don't care, dude. They'll pay somebody else to do your job. And they'll do your job fairly well. So this is a lost cause for you. So those are the first two points. But we haven't even gotten to the, the main point here yet. Ownership owns the team. It's others who are making the decision that the running back position isn't valued the way that other positions are. And I asked somebody about it today. Somebody who knows very well how the dynamics work. Somebody who's been involved in the NFL for a, a long time. I can't disclose my sources. You're just going to have to trust me on this one that I'm not getting input from, you know, guy who sweeps the floor, right? This is an actual yeah, real get it, dude. person get it. Got it. whose name you would instantly recognize. Yeah, cool. Got who, it. I, and I just said, look, because I got my theories. Probably a coach. And I had theories for years as to the running back market. What's going on? Why is the running back market depressed? Here's the response I got. Fundamentally, people don't think it's a position that leads to greater expected points and surplus value. Surplus value is the key. It's a salary cap league with finite resources, and that matters. So teams will spend on quarterback, receiver, pass rushers, and corner. Those are the positions that provide the most surplus value. You can blame Mike Shanahan and the analytics community. That's what I was told. And analytics has a lot to do with it. Look, this is how much are we paying and what are we getting? For a lower end running back, how much more are we paying for a higher end running back? And what are we getting by way of difference? Anyways, so blame the analytics community is something that um, is becoming a thing. And I saw the perfect answer to this, which the first time I saw it on Twitter, I was like, well, that doesn't even make any sense. What are you talking about? Here's what it was on Twitter. So Pro Football Talk, same exact guy. He's basically just, this is from his video, I guess, or whatever, but... Um, Pro Football Talk says, what went wrong with the running back market? As one source put it, quote, blame the analytics community. Wendell Ferreira, who is a uh, Twitter guy, a uh, Twitter guy, a Packers guy, um, says, blaming analytics for the drop in the running back market is like blaming electricity for the decline in the candle market. And when I first saw that, I was like, but electricity did create a decline in the candle market. But I think that's the point. It's actually a perfect analogy. You're right. The, electri the electricity did cause a decline in the candle market, but it was a good thing. It made things better. That's exactly the point. Analytics did cause a decrease in the analytics uh, in the running back market. But it caused the NFL to go in a way that it should have gone a long time ago. It created things. It's making things better. So yes, you can quote unquote blame them if you want. That's fine. I guess another, another way to, to say this exact same analogy is um, can blame the polio vaccine for the decline in polio. I mean, yeah, blame is a weird word, but yeah. Again, I, I would say I would love for a team to test it out and just try to focus on running, but we don't need to. It happens every year. I just showed you the Chicago Bears. I just showed you the Bears. I don't know what else you need to see. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. 
Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, Everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. What is it that a running back is providing to you? How about we look at the top quarterbacks and how those teams are doing compared to the top running backs and how those teams are doing? Aaron Jones didn't drop off. In fact, he had his best year in a long time. But our team sure dropped off. You know why? Because our quarterback dropped off. And probably also in part because our wide receiver went bye-bye. It's those positions that matter. Oh, and a pass rusher got hurt. That also is going to hurt you a little bit. Running back is, is way down the list. Josh Jacobs is the number one running back in football. The Raiders suck. Aaron Jones, number two. Packers missed the playoffs. Nick Chubb, number three. Cleveland was garbage. Tony Pollard in Dallas. A.J. Dillon in Green Bay. Tyler Algier, Atlanta. Derrick Henry, Tennessee. It's almost like exclusively bad teams. Caleb Huntley in Atlanta, bad team. Latavius Murray in Denver, a joke. Devin Singletary in Buffalo, solid. But that might have to do with the quarterback and the wide receiver situation. There's nothing here that would indicate that running back is the way to go. And again, I'm not saying it's, it's an irrelevant position. I'm saying it has a very distinct value, and that value happens to be low. Right? Linebacker matters. But there's a reason linebackers don't get quarterback money or wide receiver or pass rusher money. It's because they have less value. Not zero value, but less value. Running backs have value. And if you want to know what it is, go look at their contracts. It's higher than kickers, despite people that can't do math. Significantly higher, in fact. And honestly, I still don't understand why kicker isn't valued more, but I'm sure that's also a math thing. And again, it probably has to do with the, the replacement value, right? Like, yeah, I mean, obviously making that field goal is pretty clutch and pretty important. Although, how many games actually come down to a field goal? And then, what is the actual percentage of times that that kicker has won you a game as opposed to your replacement level kicker, whatever? I don't know, I haven't dug into it, but apparently the value is unbelievably low. Anyways, one final topic, one final point that I wanted to bring up. Mina Kimes is also doing the Save the Dolphins routine. I know, thou shalt not say anything bad about Mina Kimes. I like Mina Kimes. I think she's actually quite intelligent. She actually makes good points, unlike any of her colleagues. But in this case, she's doing the I'm trying to help my friends routine and it's not going to work. Somebody commented on Mina Kimes' tweet and said, you're worth what the market is willing to pay you. Supply and demand, simple stuff. She quote tweeted it and said, they aren't allowed to access the market until they're close to or even past the age at which their productivity starts to dip. That's the problem. Why is that a problem? Why is that a problem? I don't understand what the problem is. What, what, what is the solution to the problem? You're telling me that it's unfair that running backs aren't making more money in the same breath that you're telling me that running backs at the age of like 25 and 26 start to fall apart. I'm sorry, is that supposed to be a persuasive argument that running backs are valuable? That's a persuasive argument that I shouldn't just draft and replace and draft and replace and draft and replace? It sounds like that's exactly what you're telling me to do. If a running back can't even survive to their first actual real NFL negotiated contract, what in the heck do I care about investing a ton of money into them? Why would I even do that? And so what is the argument? They should should get a brand new, highly highly paid uh, contract? 
after one year? Here's the deal. We already have a system in place for that. Like I said, the highest paid running back right now is, um, or the, the, the running back making the most money this year is not Christian McCaffrey, it's B. John Robinson. He's making $13.7 million this year. But if you want to look at it as, as a per year thing, he's obviously significantly lower. That's fine. But the point is, that's how you get your first contract. You, you can say it's not fair because it's not negotiated, but even negotiated contracts, you're going to get what you're, what you're worth. And that's exactly what happens when you get drafted. B. John Robinson was drafted early, meaning that he was worth, according to the team that drafted him, his really high contract. So by being a really good football player, you got a really high first contract. Now, that doesn't work for things like quarterback because the quarterback market is so much higher. But it does work for running back because the running back market is low enough that if you're drafted early enough in the first round, you can be a really highly paid uh, running back right out of the gate. I mean, even if, if you just look at the total guarantees, um, he, he's $22 million in total guarantees. That's fourth highest among any running backs. It's Christian McCaffrey, then Alvin Kamara, then Derrick Henry, then Bijan Robinson, then Nick Chubb, then Jameer Gibbs for the Lions. All of them are ahead of Austin Eckler. These guys got that. Th this is big investment. And it makes sense. If you're going to invest in running back, invest in a rookie running back. You're, you're investing the most amount of money in that window when they're in their prime. And then in that second phase, they probably shouldn't get as much. Or just like Matt Miller said, which seemed to really start to upset a lot of people, if they're really good, just give them that, just elect to use the fifth year option on them. Then you can let them go. That's all you're convincing me of. So I, I find that to be a horrifically bad argument as a way to convince me that um, running backs have a lot of value. The fact that they won't make it to their first contract. And, and, and again, what is, the, what is the solution here? They should play, what, two years and then get a, a, a contract? And what do you think is going to happen? Anything different? Josh Jacobs is 25 right now. He's not able to get a contract. You think, what, 24 or 23 is going to make that big of a difference? You think if they're 23 years old, so let's say if they're 21 when they get drafted, some of these guys are already 23 when they get drafted, but let's say some of them are 21 and then they can have the option to get a new contract at the age of 23. So Josh Jacobs, the number one running back in football, who reasonably has probably three more good years, maybe. I mean, he might start falling off at 26, but I think it's safe to say that, you know, it, 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 again, we're, we're pretending he has $25 million worth of value, or even 20. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly. I haven't heard specifics about what running backs are asking for. But he's 25 years old. He wants a new big mega contract, and he can't get it. The number one Running back. So if he was 23 or 24 years old, you think he would get like a $24, $25 million contract, but because he's 25, he can't? That's a garbage rationalization. It's absolutely untrue. It's not just that their bodies break down, although that is part of the equation. It's that they don't provide value. It's why teams don't even like taking running backs in the first round, because even that amount of money is too much. Even for a rookie who has all these years in front of him and plenty of reason to believe that, that they're going to be good and everything else, even that is already, like, it's, it's too much. It's too much investment for that position. On top of, of course, you could find other players of more significant value with a much greater value surplus when you start talking about, you know, instead of that contract going to a running back, which is already putting him, you know, near the top of the market, depending on, again, which metric you're looking at, or a freaking quarterback, which is, like, free. Or, or edge rusher, or even wide receiver at this point, you're just not getting that excess value. So, I mean, this is all just complete and total nonsense. Um, I think a lot of people get like to get swept up in these kinds of things, right? They, they, they're filled with a lot of compassion and empathy, and when they see somebody seemingly hurting, which, I mean, give me a freaking break about these multimillionaire running backs. By the way, it's only the top tier that are upset. You don't hear guys making a, a million dollars pissing and moaning. It's the guys who are making 15 who think that they should be making 25 because I'm just as important as a wide receiver. The guys further down the list are begging them to go on strike so that they can start making 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 million. So I understand that that's just a, a disposition for a lot of people to have compassion for the supposed downtrodden. But you, you've got to just realize that you're just wrong. <laughs> it's just... It's just reality. It's exactly like that guy in the video said. There's two things working against running backs. I don't remember the second one, but the first one was reality. And I would rather my GM focus 
on reality rather than compassion when trying to figure out how to handle things. I know that's that's a taboo thing to say. We should only care about compassion. We should never let guys go. Guys like Jordy should just get massive contracts to stay here forever. Guys like Randall and, um, you know, we always treat people that certain kind of way and we should pay running backs a billion dollars and um, maybe we should just pay everybody equal amounts of money. We'll have the worst team in football forever, but at least we'll be the nicest, most compassionate team Um Maybe that's your disposition. It's not mine. I would rather have a ruthless, cutthroat GM who is a stone-cold, emotionless killer that only focuses on data. That's the only thing that matters, is making this team the best and most efficient football team in the NFL. It's the only thing that matters, right? How many times have we heard that? The only thing that matters is winning. Do we believe that, or is this just like we're just a family and we just want to hang out and it's not about winning, it's about love and... I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure, but I, I do know that this is a complete waste of time, everything that we're talking about, because it's not going to change until running backs can learn to provide more value, which I don't think is going to happen. Even this whole thing with, well, the NFL goes in cycles. Mm, this, ain't gonna, this isn't going to cycle. E- again, even as we move back toward running or being more powerful or any of those kinds of things, the only reason that teams are going to start doing that is so they can pass better. And again, like I said, this is why the Packers are looking for hybrid players because they're not looking for just big blocking um, tight ends. They want big guys that can also run fast because ultimately we're still we're trying to stop you from preventing us from getting the big plays so that we can get the big play. Right? It's like somebody's just blocking their head all the time, like in boxing, you know? They got their hands up, and I keep swinging at their head, and that's what the NFL's been doing. Even though they're blocking their head, we just keep swinging and hitting them in the wrist. And eventually, what teams are starting to do is they're starting to to hit them in the belly, work in the midsection a little bit. That's not because it's the most efficient way to box. Which I mean, I'm not trying to make actual boxing points here. I don't know. I think working the, the body is kind of important, but the only reason we're doing it is so that they drop their hands so that I can punch them right in the eye socket. That's it. I'm not punching you in the midsection because that's what I want to do. I'm doing it so that you drop your hand so that I can knock you out. That's the only reason there might be somewhat of a cycle. Fine. You want to screw around and play too high? You want to keep playing these stupid games? Fine. Then I'll start throwing it. You know what? It's actually perfect. I I watched the next episode of uh, Quarterbacks. It still is a pretty good show, but um, I think it was episode three or four, but Pat Mahomes was talking about how everybody's going to too high, so they're not letting you throw deep anymore. So he realized, well, I'm just going to start killing you underneath. And the 49ers actually jumped one of his routes, and um, it caused a pick. And he's like, I'm not even mad, because if you're going to start doing that, I'm just going to go right over your head. Like, he was excited that one of his balls got picked because he's been begging for this moment for safety to start driving downhill. And they ended up beating him like 45 to 20 or something. They put up a billion points on the 49ers. Because they dropped their hands. They realized that the 49ers were working everybody in the body, so they're like, well, we're going to come out and get you. So we're coming down, we're going to block our ribs. And Mahomes saw that, threw one uh, punch into somebody's elbow, and was like, are you serious? You're just going to give me your face? I'm just going (laughs) to punch the crap out of your face all day. And he did. That's the only point. That, so we're, we're not going to cycle back to where we run, where, where this run heavy thing and running is going to dominate the NFL. It's not going to be a thing. It's not. It, it may drive up value a little bit, but even that, I don't think running backs are going to contribute to that. I think, I think that's largely going to be a function of the offensive line. I think there's plenty of cases of mediocre running backs functioning just fine in really good rushing. The 49ers, they don't need a Christian McCaffrey. They have a Christian McCaffrey, and that's great in their passing game. But but they've had so... The Vikings, the Vikings, you know, they, they had, uh, what was it, Adrian Peterson, then he went down, and the next guy came in, and then I think, like, the third guy was basically a fullback. He came in. He, they were all getting, like, the same yards. It might have been Dalvin instead of Peterson. I don't know, but if you're a good running team, you're a good running team. So, and again, that's just another thing that works against running backs. The replacements, if you, if you have a good offensive line and a, and a really good rushing team you plug in some guy and he's gonna get a bunch of yards he might not have as many home run hits as a guy like dalvin but you're gonna run the ball really well i just realized we're over 40 minutes um (laughs) i i had a plan for part two um but it's gonna take way too long i mean that's gonna put us way over probably an hour 10 and i guess since we still have some days to fill i could just save that for tomorrow so i guess as much as I hate to just spend the whole time talking about this situation, 
I think we're going to be done for today. Tomorrow, and, I, and we're just going to start with it because I don't want to screw around and, and mess up all our time again. Tomorrow, we're going to take a preliminary look at the 53, and, and the plan isn't going to be to actually do a 53, but I want to start with the locks and just look at, okay, how many do we have? What does it look like? What do the positions look like? Where are we devoid of any locks? Where are we pretty much full as far as guys that we know are going to be on the team or whatever? Um, and kind of go that route. And it is kind of interesting when you look at it from that standpoint, because, you know, let's just, as for one example, look at tight end. It seems as though Josiah DeGuara is probably number one in terms of priority or in terms of like, you know, comfort level that he's going to have a role because he has the experience. But at the same time, of the top three, DeGuara, Kraft, and Musgrave, DeGuara is the only one that I can't 100% guarantee is a lock. I'm confident that he is. I'm, I, but I'm, I, when I'm talking lock, I'm saying there's no doubt. It's like Jordan Love. Josiah is not that. He's about as close to a lock without being a lock as you can get. But again, it's just kind of interesting. Same with like Yash Nyman. I think there's a, a you know 45% chance he could be our starting tackle. He also, in my mind, is not a lock. Because if Zach Tom does win that job, I mean, you still want the guy there, but you never know. Is it completely 100,000% impossible they decide to move on? And some of these guys, too, depending on their status on the team and how many years they've played, how many games they've played, etc., you know, there's a chance, assuming they probably won't get picked up, that they're going to end up on the practice squad. So anybody that has the potential, not just to be in cut, but potentially move to practice squad, you've got to consider that maybe you can't call them a lock. So there needs to be like a 0% chance that they're practice squad or cut. So anyways, I guess we'll just call that a, a sneak preview into what I want to talk about tomorrow. I am going to leave it at that, though. You guys have a good rest of your day. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.